Hi, and uh, welcome back to The Wellbeing Show. Um, and uh, I'm your host, Norm McDermott. So I've got a great guest, John Salmon, who's joined us back again last time I saw him. We were actually in real life, which tells you how long ago that was, if you can remember those experiences. Um, so well well before the pandemic, and we're going to be catching up about all of that. Before I get into introducing John properly, just want to remind you that if you're checking this show out um, on the 16th of March at nine o'clock UK time. We're live. It'd be lovely to hear from you. You can join in. Uh, James, who is my techie, who you can't see, will be scanning the uh, digital airwaves and looking for any comments and we'll share them with me. Or you can drop me a WhatsApp on 07506 319 745. That's plus 447506 319 745. Be lovely to hear from you. So if you see me looking at my phone every now and then, or just looking generally distracted and useless. That's because I'm a bloke and I can't do two things at once, but there you go. Uh, anyway, that's enough of me. Um, and um, oh, that's one of my one of my people who had a great day today. So that's a nice bit of news I've just received. Enough of that. <coughs> Welcome back, John. It's um, wonderful to have you back with me. How are yeah, you? Yeah, no, it's lo- lovely to be here. I was looking back and it was 29- April 2019 that we were in wow. the studio together. Um, so I kind of think the last two years don't really count. So it's, in theory, it's only been a couple of months since we last saw each other, right? Yes, yes, something like that. In that sort of smelly, crappy studio in Soho by uh, not far from the Opera House, which is, um, uh, yeah, I mean, it sort of, it feels, it genuinely feels like it was an absolutely alien world that I'm really trying to remember what it was like. Mm. And um, was it, it it was April, it was being dark and cold. Yeah, it was. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, but it was probably arriving a bit earlier and going to prep nearby. And That's right, like, um, yeah, thinking right. I think it's around this corner. And as you say, the kind of the alleyways of um, Soho and around Covent Garden, and yeah, knocking on the door and uh, yeah, 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 going down to the basement of the studio. But it was it was cool, right? It was yeah. uh, you know it's, it's 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 exciting. It's good to do things in person. But um, oh well, yeah. we'll. Um, better. And then um, not long after that, um, the following year, wasn't it? Then suddenly the pandemic hit. So um, let's find out a bit about you. So people won't know who you are, mm-hmm. um, given that this was quite a long time ago. And that was when we were still part of men's radio station. So um, but we, we won't have that recording, I don't think, on our sort of um, on our library. So um, John Salmon is somebody that um, has has lived experience of um, becoming, going into recovery from uh, mental health problems. Yeah, that's yeah. roughly the story. So let's, let's hear about a little bit about John Salmon before you became the sort of advocate for sort of mental wellness that you are now, sort of, who were you back back then before you understood all these things? Yeah, thank you, Noel. And again, just thank you for having me back on uh, on your show. It's just wonderful. I'm really looking forward to, yeah, chatting to you. And yeah, if there is any people watching live now, um, if there are any questions coming in, um, I just think it's just wonderful if to have these kind of opportunities to talk about mental uh, mental health, uh, well being. And um, yeah, really, just try and take have talk about it more, so we kind of take away the stigma and just try and make it as easy as possible for us to kind of look after ourselves and uh, other people around us. Yeah. And yeah, the, the kind of I guess the kind of the short story is that I think like a lot of people, especially in the last couple of years with the pandemic, of you know the work that's been done to kind of talk about mental health more, people also have. Are starting to maybe have a better understanding of what mental health is and 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 how that can be impacted um, by your lifestyle or, or a number of different factors and um, yeah it's, obviously it's, it's quite common that you know some either yourself or, or somebody you know that may be struggling now with with some form of mental illness mm-hmm. and I have been I guess touched either kind of personally I've had my own problems with my mental health when I was younger and Mm. also 
yeah, through family and friends. And, um, you know, I've, I've, I sadly lost my dad after a period of him having depression um, when I was um, 17. And he, he sadly took his life. And as a family, we didn't really know how to, to deal with his illness and also how to, to deal with his death. And mm. I guess the way that we did deal with it, um, me in particular as well, was was just to kind of bury those kind of emotions. And, um, you know, there wasn't any counselling or any kind of support that was really um, provided back then. And that, mm. and you know, and kind of an, a few years later, that kind of coping mechanism of trying to not deal with the grief and um, kind of, yeah, bit me on my ass, I guess. And um, in my first job at the kind of the turn of the millennium around kind of 99, Mm. And I ended up being, um, after kind of, for me, it com came completely out of the blue. And I, I had a psychotic episode one morning, mm. um, woke up late, missed work, and was very, very, very scared, very, very paranoid and, and worried. And um, luckily, I guess um, my brother was able to pick me up and he took me back to my mum's. And it wasn't long before I was kind of sectioned and in a mental health unit. And I guess what that did for a couple of weeks, that kind of contained me, I guess, that kind of got me to a place that, that, that I guess, kind of holding pattern, a bit like an aeroplane, just going round in circles. I was kind of safe, but, um, and yeah, that was about, that was about it. And, you know, I, I, luckily I was able to get out of hospital and it did feel like kind of escaping um, hospital. Yes. Yes. Um, I, I definitely wasn't, better when I left hospital and again still even after having something as severe as that kind of breakdown I wasn't offered really any kind of talking therapies it was still very very limited then and um yeah what turned what was a psychotic episode ended up turning into um yeah depression and and more kind of yeah more mental ill health mm. and um in the end, it was very, very lucky. I did, I did go to a very bad place. But in the end, um, luckily, I was able to get the right kind of help for me, um, which included talking therapies um, and, and time and space to kind of rebuild myself and get, my, get myself back on my feet. And that took, you know, the best, you know, a good, a good year of being off work and, um, yeah, <laughs> building up my confidence slowly yeah. and but it was that stigma no that that you know we talked about last time that the reason why you know even though I, I got to a, a better place of recovery um I wouldn't tell anybody about it because mm -hmm. of the stigma that exists there was no way I was going to tell a future employer girlfriend new mate down the pub that I'd had a mental illness right because they would all just not want to talk to me and I wouldn't get that career opportunity and I wouldn't get that girlfriend and I wouldn't all these things in my head that I thought people would think about mm. me having a mental illness meant that I didn't tell anybody about it for well over 16 years mm. Mm. and it's I mean for people who don't know I mean I do know because I've worked in that system um, I mean, people work very hard to make psych wards good and welcoming, but they are frightening things. That's it. You know, so in a in a an acute psych ward, people are in a very distressed state. And, um, and no matter how hard the staff work to make it pleasant, it's it's frightening. It's difficult. It's challenging and losing your freedom as well. You know, having people tell you what you can and can't do. Um, it, it's. It's quite, it's interesting, I think there's a gender divergence here, that often what you find with guys that is that there's a, a move into the more severe and enduring long-term mental illnesses, whereas women tend to have the more common mental illnesses such as depression and anxiety. So your story is very familiar to me as a mental health professional. As a, as a man, typically men will experience um, either their own suicidal ideation or the suicide of their, their dad or brother, you know, uh, um, and or some sort of um, period of time in um, severe sort of mental 
illness such as you um and 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 yet guys still find it almost impossible to talk about that stuff so uh, i can imagine it must have been quite hellish for you to be honest sort of, to have all those experiences and to feel like there was no real outlet for it you couldn't just i mean it's like you couldn't have a conversation with someone and say you know i'm all right now but that was really horrible what happened to me yeah i think um yeah you like definitely people that when i was in the, the final kind of day patient that where i was a hospital i guess that for a few the people like met there it was you know they had had you know a variety of different health mental health problems and that that really that did really help where you were meeting other people that were going through recovery you know some people whether it was eating disorders or you know all manner of things but I think it in the right space allows you to have empathy and understanding of what somebody else is going through that also helped partly my recovery but yeah. yeah, I think once you're out of that setting um, where, yeah, you, you know, society just, yeah, just there wasn't really an opportunity to really talk about it. And I think also probably even friends and family around you, they're probably quite nervous of almost like triggering something that like, oh, great, he's better now. Like, let's just not talk about his illness and uh everybody's everybody's just crossing their fingers that you don't end up getting ill again um so there's i think there's almost a fear of talking about it once somebody is even you know a few even a few years after recovery because it's like oh wow i don't want to set john off again or say the wrong thing yeah Yeah, like um somebody who comes out of alcoholism and everybody's hiding the bottles of wine behind their back (laughs) Sort of like that sort of thing. Hundred percent. <laughs> Absolutely, it's a it's a very odd thing. Um, I guess this is sort of this this explanation seems to me to make sense of why it became important for you to become an advocate in the field of somebody who had lived experience because of the sense of fear and isolation and stigma um, that you faced um, and the fact that it wasn't a common topic of conversation, which has become much more common, but but it certainly wasn't um, back in those days. And um, how did you get into that sort of advocacy um, space, a person who shared their story in terms of lived experience? And for people who don't know, lived experience is just a term that means that somebody's had experience of something and is willing to share um, their experience and encourage other people to share their experience in terms of mental illness and recovery from mental illness. Yeah. So, you know, even though I didn't talk about my own mental health or my men- mental illness to, to anybody, I re- really was a, a subject that I would never go near. Obviously I was, you know, tuned into, you know, if I saw something written in the n- newspaper in a positive light, Mm. Or if I saw somebody talking positively or trying to campaign, you know, about trying to improve parity of esteem between physical health provision and mental health provision, I'd make a note of those 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 individuals. And there was very few and far between, right? So Stephen Fry is probably the one that's been, you know, banging the drum for, for a number of years. But there was very, very few men at, um, that, but I, you know, I kind of like, if, if somebody like Professor Green did a documentary as um, Johnny Benjamin, I've got his book up on on the shelf here. It's a really, Johnny's good, a really cool guy. He's yeah, it's really good. Times, a lot of bits actually. Yeah, he's a wonder, wonderful man. And the you know, so over the years, I just thought, oh, that's great, they're doing it. But it was definitely something that I would never ever even go near. And as always, and then. You know, I think probably two things. So the, the main thing was um, a very close friend of mine called John. Um, his, he, gave, he gave me a call in 2016 and he, he phoned me to say that his sister had died. Mm. And his sister had also been a very close friend of mine um, a number of years as well. Previous, we kind of lost touch a bit. Um, but she sadly took her life um mm. after 
we kind of kind of had a, a bout of postnatal depression mm. with her second child, and that that obviously was incredibly sad news to to get that call. I'll never never forget mm. receiving that call. But what it did inside me was, as well as sadness, was one of anger, was one of how come in 2016 there is somebody who is suffering with an illness mm. who's not been able to get the help that they need. Mm. And I really, I guess I'd hoped that since my dad had been ill and I had been ill, that things had improved enough that somebody like John's sister would have been able to get the right help. Mm. And it was just a massive wake up call for me. Mm. And I, again, I, I kind of, I, I look back to it now that if the right help had been there for my, my dad, he would probably still be here today and similar for, for John's sister. And I decided that I wanted to do something. Um, and the, the kind of most simple thing for me, I thought, <laughs> he thought, was to, to go running. Running has really helped me um, and helped me. Like, I'm, I don't run every day. Um, I'm not like a mad runner. Um, and so especially when I was still in kind of recovering from my mental illness, it was a real struggle just to, you know, literally go for a small walk yeah. without the fear and, and, and the worry. And it's a big frigging exhaustion of being lost. I, just, yeah. it's, I, I think people are, uh, who maybe not have experienced directly mental illness, they understand how physical it is. Because I, I think the way it's talked about often, it's talked about as though it's just your head's messed up a little bit, but it's actually not. I mean, it smashes into your body um, yeah. in a similar way. Yeah, no, I, I went, I remember going for a run with my brother, or it wasn't really a run, but going out with my brother and another friend. And I, yeah, I just didn't have the energy, right? I was just, and I was, I was still very nervous and paranoid and just, just not comfortable even being out right mm. um but i'd seen that kind of the benefit over the years of slowly doing getting out a bit of exercise so i thought kind of a challenge would be to run the london marathon and um i just also wanted to raise money the london marathon obviously does an amazing job of raising millions of pounds for charity mm. and i wanted to raise a, some money for a mental health charity that supported young families and came did Google did its magic. And I found a charity called best beginnings. Yeah. They have a brilliant um, app, baby buddy app and website with really informative um, videos and information for, for, for parents. And they seem like a, a brilliant charity to run for. They really kind of tick the boxes for me. Mm. And um, they were, there was this thing called Heads Together and didn't really know what that was. But um, what after kind of being offered a, a place to be in to, to run the marathon for Best Beginnings, I got the message that um, it was part of this Heads Together campaign, which was set up by the, the royals, by the young royals. And sometimes they've been referred to as uh, William, Harry and Kate. And they had the idea to bring a, eight different mental health charities together um, to work together to really tackle stigma. Mm -hmm. And um, that really set me on my journey of kind of sharing my lived experience, as you would say, um, quite publicly. So I ended up going from not telling anybody to sharing my story in sharing a stage with, with the Royals and Rio Ferdinand and a few, a few other people um and oh, no, do, no, like you do he's afraid of the stigma i didn't want anybody to know uh, uh, so i'll just go on the stage with the royals and talk about yeah. it as my first step that's exactly. extraordinary john it's like, yeah. so it was it was um and then and because it's together and i remember um that, that that those three were amazing at sort of uh, obviously, they they just had that influence to pull people in, didn't they? So, hundred percent, yeah. It was game, yeah, it was game changer really because um, a that that power of collaboration, charities coming together to work together for a, you know to, to really tackle the stigma, 
Um, it was a very, really well thought out kind of campaign. And yeah, the, it, you know, as you say, for me, when I, I got, you know, when I did that first um, talk, I had oh, no I idea. I had no oh, idea that it was going to yeah, be. Oh, my God, I just like to talk about why tackling stigma is important. Um, on, on, the, on a very basic level, and people need to understand this. Um, stigma stops people getting help. If you stop people getting help, they end up dead. Yeah. That's the way it works, which is why tackling stigma, particularly for high profile people such as the Royals, the Rio Ferdinand, et cetera, um, it is absolutely vital because it directly saves lives. You don't need to build psych wards. That's not what the issue is. Um, the issue is to get people to understand that they're ill and that it's a treatable illness and that there is help available and that they go and ask for that help. Yeah, yeah. completely. And completely. then you save lives. That's it. It's the bottom line. It's really straightforward um, because the support that we do have for people when it's available and when it's accessed really, really works, which is we'll come to that later. But I think it's really important that uh, people understand that and they understand why somebody like yourself, John, um, is so vital what you do because you are saving lives. Every time you talk about something, you're encouraging somebody else to talk, to go, okay, that's fine. I'm like him. And he went and got help and he's all right. And that's another life saved. Yeah. And I, and I, and I think you put it really, really well there, Noel. And I think people sometimes, like myself, feel, you know, that how do I have that conversation or how do I go about saying yeah. something? And, you know, the it's, it, yeah, of course, it's not going to be that, that easy. Um, but, you know, you sometimes don't need to say a lot to, if you can find the right person um, that's going to listen. Um, it's been incredible um, just by... Yeah, over the last few years, the amount of people that have, you know, talked to me more openly about how they're feeling. Um, and that that's that's the winner. And anybody can do that, right? You don't um showing that understanding and empathy um can, you know, if you can create that space with your friends and family, as you say, it's there's an opportunity to, you know yeah, fundamentally kind of save a life, I guess, then in no, the long run. Absolutely. And you don't need to be a mental health professional, as you say, to do that. Um, it's got to learn to shut up and listen. hundred percent. hundred percent. Yeah. So yeah, my, my, my mate, Steve, that, you know, really helped me when I was, you know, really ill, he would come and visit me in hospital and we've talked about it since. And he said, I, I was so nervous. I was so scared. I didn't know what to say. As you say, kind of psychiatric wards and stuff, are, they're not like, not the, <laughs> they're not, not, not the calmest. The of folks, they're really not. <laughs> 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 and he said that as well. He said exactly to me going, um, I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what to do. But he was brilliant because he did just, um, he, he allowed me, he listened, right? And even if I wasn't making much sense, for that period of time, I was like, here's somebody I trust and um, they're listening and they're, they're chipping in with a few points and directions and, you know, trying to be a bit positive and, you know, guide the conversation a bit. But, yeah, he's not a mental health expert. You know, he's, you know, he's just a mate trying to trying to be a good mate by listening. And so if you go from a psych ward to sharing a stage with the Royals. Yeah. <laughs> it's like... It's great. And in between, you decided to run the London Marathon because you want to raise money for a charity and you're inspired by doing this, maybe through anger, sort of because uh, another person has taken their life unnecessarily, okay, yeah. when they could have got help. Um, so there you are. Um, tell us about the sort of running and the marathon and why it was important to do that for you in particular because when the show is is called running for health running for mental health mm. um, what was it about the the running and um the marathon that was particularly drawing you and and how did it work for you in terms of sort of your recovery yeah so as i mentioned the 
you know getting to to run being able to run a marathon um took a to, took you know 20 years right so i'd might as i, I, mean, I think you're then, bonkers for doing it personally sort of oh, like, well you know we'll see uh, we'll see there's still you know there's still time to convince you i've got absolutely. No, 35 absolutely. minutes to convince you why you know, well, it's a good idea um i just want to die of the thought of it i'm so <laughs> impressed that you can do it um well yeah we'll come on to it but i i, I think what is well i say it now but i think what is so inspiring about things like the london marathon yeah. if you've ever gone to watch actually it's not it's not 20,000 mo farrers running it's you know 20,000 people of all ages sizes abilities yeah. and you know it's a bit it's whether you know it's a similar kind of couch to 10k or all these things if you put too much emphasis on it it feels like an unachievable mountain to climb yeah. um But actually, yeah, the marathon is, is it's a bloody long way, but it's um, it's more it's more achievable than it it's marketed as right as what people think, and the people like um, it's amazing people that have been running the London Marathon for a number of years, really trying to challenge that perception of what a marathon runner looks like and who who can do do that type of thing. Bryony Gordon is a brilliant journalist and has been running um, the London Marathon for a, a good few years. So, you know, and really encouraging um, predominantly women to 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 get out and do some exercise. Yeah. Um, But I think if I remember your question um, before I go on a little marathon tangent um, was, you know, over the years, you know, I started to apply for little races and little runs, little kind of organized 5Ks. And, it, you know, it did take me, you know, a long, you know, there used, used to be this really good 10K around London hmm. and I'd finish that. And honestly, I was, you know, I'd collapse, you know, after doing 10K. Yeah. And it's just, it's crazy the, how the mind works, right? And that it's, you know, obviously you've got to be physically fit enough to run any distance, whether it's running for a bus or running a marathon, you know, if you've got a bus knee or whatever, it's going to be a lot harder. But I generally think if, um, you know, just having a, some general fitness and building up slowly, means you can start to take on longer distances and bigger challenges because actually it's it's less about the physical and it's more about the mental um I agree. motivation um, having teased you about um there's something wrong with you for running a marathon i actually did in the first lockdown the first summer i got up to 20k at one point um because, well i just knew that i was going to struggle I had to do something and having a goal around this stuff and getting out physically and running when we weren't allowed to socialize and all that sort of stuff um, stopped me from losing the plot in a serious way. Um, and sort of, yeah, it was, it was really important. There were a lot of people doing it at the time as well. And I got that sense of community because a lot of like the, the communal running together could no longer happen, but people yeah. were doing it via Strava and all these apps Uh, we're running together via the online app world. And um, it was a, you know, it's a real sense of com camaraderie and connection and um, being being in something together with other people. So I really understand that. Uh, and as well as a sort of uplifting, and I was doing it partly because the, the virus also was attacking the lungs and all that sort of stuff. So I wanted something that would strengthen my breathing. Um, so you do the marathon, you become sort of quite high profile is was that then a step into for you well I'm going to sort of now move on for want of a better word into more professional presentation of this type of experience or what were you doing uh, at that point yeah so at that point um yeah I was running and I still run my own own business yeah. um Yeah, this was never, it was never part of the plan to be talking to you, to be talking about um, mental health, mental illness. Um, but I guess over the last kind of five years, what's been lovely is the two worlds, my working world yeah. and also, yeah, my the stuff I kind of do on the side around mental health has kind of 
started to merge together. And I think it has been about... So tell me about the working world so that we get a broader sense of you. Yeah, so I run an agency called Byte Entertainment and we produce videos and websites. Um, yeah, so we're for, for different charities and organisations. Um, I love gadgets and innovation. So the moment something new comes along, I will have generally bought it. I'm yeah. here in my loft at the moment. And if I look over there, it wouldn't take too long to pull out some bit of tech that no longer anybody wants to use. And so, yeah, setting up Byte Entertainment really was the, the opportunity to have my own business and to work with amazing clients, be quite selfish, really, of trying to work with interesting people wanting to do good things. And, and working in the creative industries as well. Yeah, completely. Yeah. So... I mean, again, um, it's it's interesting because we the, the sort of I guess the prototypical image of somebody who's been locked up in a psych ward is not a successful business owner, is not a marathon runner, is not somebody who's sitting on a stage with royals um, talking about the importance of challenging stigma. Um, I guess most people's prototypical image of somebody who's been locked up in a psych ward is you know, homeless and dependent on state handouts, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but that's not true in your case. I think, do you think you're just unique or is have you met other people that have succeeded? Uh, and yeah, um, I'm probably unique for certain things, but definitely not for that. You know, the, the, you know, the statistics sadly bear, bear out the reality of, you know, how, how many people are suffering as we speak from a, from a mental illness and that, is doesn't matter what background you're from whether you've got a nice you know car in the drive or 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 you're homeless right it's it doesn't discriminate mental illness and it can affect anybody and um that's what has also been just like like the wow moments where i get a message or a friend said oh can we go go for a drink in a couple of days and then they they share with me going oh well actually I'm I'm on antidepressants. I ended up being yes. in the hospital, yes. and you're like, but you're, you know, you're managing like a thousand people in a like a really massive organization. Like, exactly. yeah. <laughs> so I think it's just the, it's just the portrayal, isn't it? You know, it's the head in hands. It's you know, it's the, the way mental illness has been kind of marketed, you know, by media and yeah. everybody of 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 certain type of person, and that's. You know, when I the, the the reason one of the motivations that keeps me talking, um, I always think I'm not not a great great speaker, but until somebody that comes along or more people doing it, I'll I'll keep on doing when I'm asked to do stuff. But You're fishing reason, for a complaint ain't gonna happen. <laughs> the reason the reason when I finished that first talk, the, this person came up to me and she said, "It's so nice to hear a guy speaking." Yeah, and I was like going, "What?" I could have literally said anything, right? Um, I could have probably said two words and she probably would have still said, wow, it's so nice to hear a, a guy speaking. And maybe also, yeah, because of my background, because of what I look like is, and, you know, I've got two kids and I, all these other bits and pieces that you wouldn't historically think of somebody that had, yeah, been ser- really seriously ill in in hospital. Yeah, you don't um, get sectioned because you're a little bit down. No, it's not the way I know this and people don't understand it, but it's very, very serious stuff. Um, and, um, and and people's rights protected who are sectioned and all that sort of stuff. It, it, but it is it, it's not very common. It's for, and and uh, it's an interesting story that you have. Um, and I wonder how many people who are in recovery from these experiences aren't talking about them. Um, uh, again, maybe because of stigma, because they're worried about how people will think about them. Yeah, I think so. And, and also just, you know, there was, especially those first few years trying to get back on my feet, I didn't want to talk about it, yeah. right? I, I, didn't, yeah. I, want, yeah. I didn't feel strong enough to talk about it. And, yeah. and I think that's sometimes a problem with some campaigns that have happened recently, which, you know, whether it's there's high profile ones on ITV or whatever that that's talking about, it's good to talk and everything. And it really is good to talk. Um, but also don't feel under pressure to talk. You know, the, the, I've definitely met people that have been talking about their 
mental health and their mental illness and they're still quite ill and they're probably not got the support and stuff and and with, i've seen it in fact i saw it at um a, a conference i'm not going to name because i think you, you went to it as well but there was definitely one of the speakers there which i ended up having to support quite a lot because they were very vulnerable and there wasn't appropriate support in place and 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 um yeah i mean i i think that that is an issue that the field needs to look at um but on the whole my feeling is i don't know about your but my feeling is having brought in more people with lived experience to discuss what's going on has improved um the the presentation and that that issue you said about marketing um the marketing of mental illness people have been ill has been absolutely important i suppose because you know it, it's an attempt to get resources or something like that i don't know what it is but mm. it's pretty much deficit based as i yeah would not you at know. all asset based the assumption is you have a mental illness that's the whole of you you're stuffed it's like, yeah. no i mean it's an aspect of who we are as human beings and even with severe and serious uh, mental illnesses such as yours it's an aspect of who you are it's not the totality of you um so i wanted to sort of lay the sort of groundwork a little bit and people get this idea and understand that um you are pretty hot shit <laughs> when it comes you are john forget it you are um anybody sort of gets into recovery is extraordinary because mm-hmm. it's it's horrifying it's terrifying going through those types of experiences and, and rebuilding your life in whatever way you don't have to become you know on the stage with the royals in the way that you did john but just getting back to life um is a amazingly courageous thing to do when when people when you've been frightened by your own mind yeah but i think i think um what it does and other people that i've met that have gone through similar to me have gone through that recovery stage i think also it does give you that ability to listen to your body more um you've <laughs> you've learned right the those those telltale signs of when something may not be right where you're not sleeping properly um, where you may be overthinking yeah. certain things, you, you, you know, that's that's the benefit, right? Of 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 going through something so horrible, is that you can start to actually look after yourself better. You know, can what can improve and impact on on your well being, yeah. um, and uh, and bizarrely, I think you know, you have to ask the people that's worked for me over the years whether I'm just completely lying and making this up. But I think that managing people after having a, a mental illness has made me a better manager of people because I uh, want to get I, I want to get the best I want to get uh, the best I, I out of you agree. but I don't want it to be to the you know negative on your on your home life or on your you know on your 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 personal your, your own health and yeah. so I think, I, th- I think I hope over the years that I've been able to try and push people but also knowing like take you know when i'm being be really quick to say right take the day off take two days off take as long as you need you know your health is more important than this video that we're filming or this website that's got to go live you know it's just your health is number one and i think it's 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 knowing that balance of when to push absolutely also knowing when to take the foot off yeah so so here's the story you you come from like a quite traumatic tragic background um, which is disturbing in terms of your father your experience in hospital and you put your life back together and you discover sort of running and this passion and being part of the community that does that um and then you know we met a few years ago and you're successful in all of these areas you're a great advocate and um good at sharing lived experience and being humble about it all those things uh, and then like a year after you and I met this extraordinary thing happened called the pandemic and what happened i mean i i sort of can only imagine it was quite a challenge yeah it was um so i'd been really i guess on one hand i've been really lucky that up until the christmas um of 2020 was it um the had been really busy i'd i'd got my fair share of travel in 
um and um i've been doing a lot of work for for fifa and um so it was brilliant and i was probably doing a bit too much work and um i actually decided to take january off to spend a bit of time with my kids mm. fix the broken toilet seats do a little bit of work around the house because because obviously january is a quietish month anyway and f- work will pick up you know footballs will still get being kicked later in the year and i'll just pick up the work um a few months later and um yeah as we know we all had plenty of time to fix and do diy for yeah. <laughs> like two years and and i think for me the you know i was probably a bit uh, every, every, everybody's experience of the pandemic has been different and at different stages. Um, for me, with two young kids, one of my my son has had breathing difficulties and and stuff when he was younger, and obviously the news was building in its intensity before we got to lockdown, and I I started to catastrophize. I started to really worry about the health of friends and family. Um, I was worried about money and that, well, can't you see what's going to happen? Like all of our, and so what savings I had, I thought was going to just evaporate as markets collapse and everything. So I really got into a, a quite a negative space of, yeah, second guessing what I thought was going to happen. And I did talk about it. Um, I did kind of, but it was difficult because every, everybody else was trying to deal with it in their own way. My my wife has got a very important job and she was very busy trying to sort out her team and mm-hmm. office and everything. Um, and so it was, yeah, for me, I don't know I, like how, how you found it, but for me, I've, it, it, those even before lockdown, I found it pretty tough going. The, the first lockdown for me was okay because I tend to be socially anxious. And so actually avoiding contact with people, being told I had to do that was sort of okay. And I seem to remember it was a nice summer. It was lovely, yeah. But the, when it came to the Christmas, that's when I, I began to fall apart and I spoke to my GP and got some meds and stuff like that because it was just... I mean, I sort of knew that I was going to struggle at that point and... Mm. Uh, sort of because at that point it was wearing me down. So um, that's when, I mean, I really cut back on everything and I got some meds prophylactically just to sort of help smooth things out. And I did a lot of resting at home. I did a lot of putting on weight. That was okay. And sort of really cutting down on things and and um, taking care of myself because, um, um, because I have these vulnerabilities. So... But like you, I'm lucky I've learned that I have the vulnerabilities and I'm lucky I've learned what helps me. Yeah. And like going, going, you know, when we were allowed to go go for a little run and stuff, that, yeah. that really, really helped. But also going to bed really helps, right? <laughs> just, um, just yeah. Um, yeah, because I know it will pass, right? I know that, like, as you say, like if you've been through, through it, it doesn't, you know, you, you you know it will pass in the end. You've got it's to kind of ride it out. I'm interested, if you don't mind, just discussing a little bit about because I think it is for guys in particular that you've touched upon a couple of things that I think for men trip them over the edge. One is not being able to be the provider. Yeah. Uh, and whether we are the main provider or not is not the issue. It's still part of our sort of make up to believe that we should be bringing in the bread. And, and yeah. then also the dad stuff, having kids and not being available for them. And I imagine both of those were quite triggering subjects for you and quite emotionally challenging subjects for you to think about. How did you sort of resolve that stuff? What did you do to sort of help yourself and get yourself through that, do you think? Yeah. um, Yeah, I think, you know, the the good things that, well, I was able to, you know, try, you know, I ended up, because my wife was, she was really busy with work and my work had just kind of disappeared, you know? Yeah. So that kind of providing bit was kind of, at least, you know, I guess the government was, you know, relatively quick to start offering kind of furlough and, and bits and pieces, yeah. but that was, you know, <laughs> I was like, I was like, well, that's not in the bigger schemes. 
did, did it was good that that was provided but that that didn't reduce my anxiety yeah. um the i think what was good though was obviously i had these two little people or young people to 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 look after and to care for and try and make sure they were happy and having you know as good a time as possible where you know they they felt feel like they're you know, and said you said the weather was great. You know, it really was. So we were very lucky that we've got a small garden, and you know, we could try and. You know, it's been wonderful, kind of spending so much more time with my kids, right? It's, and it's really fascinating. A lot of a lot of men I talked to have said that that there was something happened during, even though it was a struggle. Something happened during that time in terms of connection with your family, and uh, and something significantly changed. My boy lived in France. He does and not lived. He still lives there. So okay. it was a slightly more challenging to um, um, to sort of get out to see him. But it, it was again, it was that sense of meaning and purpose, the connection to him, and and wanting to sort of maintain the love relationships really struck me. Um, so you have this period of turmoil, period of loss. Again, because of the skills you have, you come through it. Uh, and I think it's important that people understand this that. Um, recovery from mental illness doesn't mean that you know you just sort of um, reach this lovely plateau and everything's happy and you've got nice little flowers and all that uh, it, it comes and goes it ebbs and flows and life circumstances can knock you back but but hopefully like you um, you've got the skills and resources in place to manage more effectively just- yeah and I, and I think it's, it's again with better ed- education with yeah things like your show um guy guys that actually want to know right but they just have they just don't know they're just out of the loop a lot of the time of of where to get help or or what what's available or what they should be doing yeah. you know again slightly down to role models and yeah. you know yeah like, but yeah to change those behaviors right so you, you stabilize i guess at some point and then you start developing new projects mm which I think it might be nice to discuss now. So the sort of, um, you come through this again, Phoenix-like, you rise, um, and then you begin to sort of develop some projects. And you, uh, there's like, there's a huge list of them, (laughs) um, which is Speakers Collective, what's going on in your head, uh, John and John run New York, let's talk about loss, Brave to the Moon, SK, I mean, seriously? (laughs) Like, of, tell me about some of those things that you, you've been doing over the last couple of years, which have been, I guess, directly linked to your recovery, but also helping other people in many ways. So, yeah, the I guess I, I, I like having lots of things on. I like being busy. I really do, John. <laughs> um, and <laughs> well, whether I like it or it's just like this the way I am, I guess yeah. I kind of um, I sometimes... Yeah, wonder it would be a bit more simple just doing one thing. Um, but anyway, the but I, and again, it's more. It's I think it's the last five years just been more open. And right. it's funny. It's funny when you're open about yourself and when you're open about maybe what's kind of important to you. Yeah. Um, your life does change a little because yeah. you start to interact with other people who are like minded as yourself or they may say oh uh, john uh, yeah, talk to this person or and it's, there was some some wonderful coincidences that or serendipity or however you want to put it or you know was it something to do with the cosmos but there was some real planets aligning on a few different things and i think as that fear had slightly ebbed away had, had kind of disappeared that just thought oh let's let's give it a go let's let's try and also I, you know, to, from the heads together point of view, that collaboration is so. If you can find, if you've got an idea, however silly you think it is, if you can find one other person that thinks actually that's that's got legs, or why don't you try and do that? It doesn't need, you know, a hundred people to, to to try and get you to to try and do something. And I think that's what's been lovely about the different projects that I've been involved in. Um, have generally come from a you know either myself or somebody else that said oh could we do this and i'm like yeah of course we can right and um and 
the yeah so some of the projects you mentioned there so there was rave to the moon and um, so there's a amazing beatboxer called um sk shlomo mm -hmm. and um i've done some work with him during lockdown he did this show every um i think it was every thursday a live youtube show getting kids to beatbox and we made a song at the end of the seven week show run um that um yeah it was, was brilliant so definitely google that um kind of sk shlomo and and beatboxing and off the back thanks, of that thanks we'll put a link out there so yeah so. off the back of that off the back of doing those um kind of kids online um youtube shows that Shlow came up with um we were obviously still in lockdown when it came to new year and this idea of like oh my goodness there's going to be another there's going to be a new year where we're all going to be stuck at home yeah and had this idea of could we you know get everybody dancing in their living rooms raising money for charity and um rave to the moon sounded quite catchy <laughs> and um you know a domain name was bought a website was built and um some amazing artists were booked um that that performed all from from home and we we partnered with a with an app called sweatcoin yeah. and people thousands of people downloaded this app and it as you move the step counter um, we were able to kind of bring all the steps together from everybody taking part and we had a, a visual representation of a spaceship trying to get to the moon and um, in real time we could see people donating um, to their charity their chosen charity and also um, the steps we could see the thousands of steps we, we went past the international space station we didn't we didn't sadly make it to the moon this this time but Actually, was... I need some help at the moment. You might need to do it. <laughs> thing, apparently, okay. <laughs> so they need some help to get back to Earth. Okay. Well, we're uh, we're floating around somewhere mid, uh, kind of up in the near the stars at the moment. But um, <laughs> but that was again just an idea, right? The and I think that was what was great about lockdown because people were stuck at home. Yeah. Creative people, people that wanted to try and do something to create connection. Um gave that opportunity and so what's interesting for me about this james just to say my james is a techie guy i forwarded you the email with all the links that john sent to me so we can put those links out there and people can see them but what's interesting me and what intrigues me about this is this notion of transformation um that you go through these horrible experiences and it is possible to transform them into these creative, fun, wonderful experiences. I don't think you need to go through horrible experiences to be creative. That's not what I'm saying. But, but it's, it's the shift from that deficit to that asset-based model. So we can stay in the deficit and say, oh, woe is me, this is a problem. Or we can shift the frame, can't we? And it seems to me that that's what you're about, John. That, that's what you try to do each time within the vulnerabilities, within the limits of your humanness and that you can be broken. But it seems to me that that's sort of your energetic impulse is to look for well, with, you know, the collaborations, et cetera. But how do I transform this? How do I create something from this? Is that a reasonable thing to say about you? I, I think so. And I think, you know, I've, I've worked in sectors where it's incredibly competitive and where there there really is no new ideas and you're just trying to slightly do it better yeah. um the, the mental health space because it is has been so underfunded it has been so stigmatized yeah. actually what is a breath of fresh air is that you can do something however big or small it could be a bake sale or it could be trying to rave to get to the moon right it can yeah. whatever it is it yeah. will make a difference and also you will be supported yeah. and um i think that that's what is quite exciting for me is that yeah. something that's a bit of a silly idea or you know that but could this work it has an audience that because 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 you can kind of tap into a group of people that aren't currently being reached and whether that's by mu music by doing a music event by doing um yeah setting up safe spaces for people to talk about loss and bereavement that let's talk about loss do you know there's there's lots of things that can be done in this space where if you're motivated to try to do something you will make a difference and yeah. that's what i love i love you know the fact that it is 
once you kind of tap into this space, it's very, it is very collaborative a lot of the time and people try. I, and help I agree. And I, I think it's also, there's a lot of kindness in the space and there's a lot of compassion from particularly from people that bring in lived experience is there's, there is that sense in which, well, I've been there and done it and I, I get it. And, um, and, and I, I, you know, I'm going to help you because I know it helps me. Um, and that sense of competition just drops off, I think. Yeah, definitely. And you, you mentioned lived experience and I really think kind of, you know, lived experience is a brilliant way to bring about change, yeah. you know, and um, you know, cause it does bring, you know, you've obviously got the professionals, but really if you've got somebody who's got that lived experience who will bring the reality of that illness or that experience to life. And one of the, I guess, the things that I found by sharing my lived experience, you know, just like you're saying nice things to me, you know, we'll finish this call and, you know, they will, especially if you're early on in sharing your story, you, you, you know, if you've been on the news or you've in the local newspaper, there will be a time where you were like, was that a good idea? Why, you know, what are people are thinking of me? And I think it's so important that we create a space that's supporting people who yeah. share their lived experience. And that was, you know, one of the motivations for being part of the Speakers Collective and a, and a director along with um, Joe Emerson is to create this community of people that share their lived experience, not just on, on mental health, on a variety of subjects, but they've got that that support network there of other understanding people that yeah. know what it's like to share share your lived experience. Yeah. And there's no, I mean, the, sometimes I think it's presented that there's the professional way and there's the lived experience way, and they're not separate like that. Because I remember, like, I'm I'm so old at this stuff. It's like ridiculous so long I've been around doing it. But I remember 25 years ago now, sitting in a trust meeting, a mental health trust meeting, where they were discussing the evidence that demonstrates that if people, senior managers within that trust were to share their experience of um, psychological distress, um, the, there would be a significant reduction in uh, time off sick for staff because those staff would be encouraged to go and seek help earlier. And, and so we've known about this. The evidence is unassailable that encouraging people to share their experience of distress and in particular distress and then overcoming it um, because that's the vast majority of people. That's the experience. They they have the psychological distress. They learn the tools and resources. They get into recovery, and then they learn to manage that distress better. And they get on with their lives and they rebuild their lives. So your story is is very familiar to me, but it's not one that gets out in the press. They seem to want the story of the person who had a dreadful time and ended up not you know, somewhere in some cul-de-sac somewhere. But that's not the truth of mental illness. Mental illnesses affect so many people. I mean, the, you would, in many ways, looking at the stats, you would say mental illness is the norm. And, mm. it is. and yet somehow we still seem to be going as a society. So that tells us something, doesn't it? Yeah, it tells us we just yeah need to create a more compassionate, yeah. understanding world right and um yeah, before the, we finish i want to talk about your new york stuff mm, your sort of <laughs> yeah so <laughs> what's going on there yeah so obviously we've had a pandemic and we haven't been able to travel anywhere and um at the beginning of the year i know some people don't like new year's resolutions and stuff and all that but i i always look at it as like a a, a clean slate to have a have another go and um yeah the beginning of the year kind of came up with a couple of different ideas and one of the, one of the ideas was to run um the it was fi- it'll be five years it, was, it is five years since john and i ran the london marathon wow. john now lives in america so i was like oh what do we do to john who's the death yeah, of- so yeah sorry yeah john <laughs> whose sister died yeah so john who i ran the 2017 london marathon um he yeah so i kind of sent him a message actually i created a whatsapp group with the turvers in it <laughs> called new york run 2022 and um yeah we obviously we didn't have a place or anything i bought a domain name john and john dot run um with both different spellings of john because he spells it the wrong way with an h 
and um what a strange guy <laughs> exactly and so we're that's that that's the plan we've now got a place um two places luckily um running for the samaritans in new york Brilliant. and so yeah check out john and john dot run as we try and figure out um i'm definitely not match fit at the moment so um but it's going to be really interesting I, I want to also do research into running and the the importance that running can have on people's well-being and so as well as raising money also want to actually do some research off the back of it as well great so people can donate and support you and the charity and that you are supporting as well james will have put the link out there but just tell us the domain name again yep so it's john john and john dot run so it's either j-o-h-n and j-o-n dot run or the other way around. Um, right, there you go. And um, John, is, I mean, it's just, I love talking to you. It's, it's sort of amazing. It's, it's like, you're like this sort of onion that on peels. It's like, you know, and, and yeah, and then I have that thing and, all, and then I've got this family and then I've got this business, then I've got this and then I've got that. And then, and then that's how it is. And I love the sort of way um, you engage with your life and the way that you engage with your recovery. And um, and one of the things that strikes me is that um, you're so damned normal. It's great. It's really approachable. Okay. It's like, this is the way it is. Mm. It, it's, it, yeah, it didn't, but it didn't, it didn't always used to be this way. And I think that, that's the thing. It's, um, but, it, you know, partly maybe it's a bit, bit that comes from age and realising what's again what's the worst that happened that person won't talk to me again but i think yeah. you know i think it's um and these things take time you know it's easy in an hour to rattle off all your successes but i think also again it it takes time to do it and that's fine right and so well, don't be put off the point is this so yes it does take time it takes hard work and it takes learning and growth and development it takes humility it takes accepting that you're vulnerable um but it is possible to reach a point and if somebody's struggling at the moment it is more than possible to reach a point at some point in your life where you're sitting rattling off your successes rather yeah. than ruminating about your fears yeah and just as a final point i guess so you know i mentioned the samaritans and you know if anybody is listening to this if they are str- struggling and they're you know they've, it's difficult to turn to a friend or somebody to support you know Samaritans there 24 yeah. 7 you can dial, phone them up on 116 123 and you know they're just again just an amazing resource there of thousands of volunteers that are ready to 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 listen that's a good way to end pick up that phone folks it's really cool john you say that i'm gonna have to say goodbye thanks everybody for joining us um it's um it, it just love bringing back guests from some years ago and catching up and as yeah, people let's, let's hope it's not two years we, we, yeah hopefully it's, <laughs> I'll, I'll see you out running on that marathon that was the other bit that was uh ah, that mar- start line that is now called the snickers bar that's the marathon i run on <laughs> all right you stay there john goodbye to everybody see you all next week and um uh, yeah have a, have a great week in between goodbye <laughs>